Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this morning. We thank you again to be in the Lord's house. We thank you especially for Brother John and his preaching and his sermon this morning, Lord. We pray that we would all have humility, not humility that seeks to be recognized as humble, but a, a humility that seeks to emulate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. May everything that we do in this room, everything that we do in this church, everything we do in our homes and in our workplaces be for one purpose and one alone, to glorify that Savior, that we might walk after Him all our days, that we might show that Savior, share that Savior with others. It's in His holy name we pray. Amen. Alrighty, so we're finally out of the 16th century after three grueling weeks. So we did Luther, and then we did Zwingli, Calvin, and the Reformed, and then we did the English Reformation, Henry VIII and his six wives, which we remember how. What's the motto? Huh? Dead, beheaded, divorce, beheaded, divorce, beheaded, die, divorce, beheaded, survive. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> So, awesome. in case you're ever in some kind of trivia contest. <laughs> uh, today we're going to move on to the 17th century, and as I said, we're going to do the 17th century in two weeks, because there, again, is a lot of stuff, especially religiously, happening during this time in church history. So, there's no way to do it in one week. So, we're going to do it in two weeks. Today we're going to focus on the continent. Right? When I say the continent, I mean the European continent. The next week, we're going to focus on England, because England's got its kind of its own stuff going on at the same time, which is especially influential for us who are American Protestants, because much of what we inherit, whether you come from an Anglican tradition, a Baptist tradition, a Methodist tradition, an Episcopalian tradition, all stems from some of the events in England in the 17th century. So today, we're going to start with the European continent, and then we'll move on to next week, which includes my boys, the Puritans, so it should be exciting times. So let me ask you, what happened in Lutheranism after Luther, Luther's death? We talked about Luther's death. Luther dies 1546, and then we kind of left the story there. We didn't even talk about the rest of the 16th century with Luther. So Luther dies February 1546. What do you think happens? What was that, sir? It continues. Well, yes, there are Lutheran churches, indeed. Well done. What else? Okay. What about Melanchthon? It splits. Yeah, it splits. It, it goes immediately into doctrinal controversy. That's surprising. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is Luther's death mask, by the way. It was real popular back in the day for people to take mold of your face when you died. Uh, I've seen John Wesley's. They, they nailed the nose in the paintings. Uh, that's Martin Luther's actual death mask. So if you actually want to know what Martin Luther looked like, you know, imagine more color and such. But that's what Martin Luther looked like when he died. Uh, when he died... So obviously when he died, he left behind his family. He left behind his wife, Katerina, three sons and a daughter. He had two other daughters that predeceased him. I think we talked about one of those daughters uh, during the Luther lecture. And so Emperor Charles V, no one could really... Luther was such a unifying force among Lutherans, among opponents of Catholicism, that Charles V, and Charles V was so busy doing other stuff, he never really had the power or the clout, no, even though he was a Holy Roman Emperor, to really crush Luther. Luther dying was just the excuse that Charles V needed to reimpose the Catholicism that he thought should be uniform throughout the empire. And also he had kind of vanquished some of his other enemies as well. So uh, he gets in a war with the Protestant League, we called it the Schmal Catholic League. We talked about it a little bit. It was kind of a imagine a, a NATO of Protestant princes. Uh, he crushed that league in 1547. He marched into Wittenberg. So very shortly after Luther died, Luther is buried in the castle church. While he was standing at Luther's grave, one of his men said, "Let's dig him up and burn him," because as we've seen in history, that's very popular. Yes, right? Who did? Who's a a morning star of the Reformation we saw? Wycliffe. Yeah, Wycliffe. Wycliffe. 30 years later, they dug up Wycliffe and burned him. This is, you know, a year later. And Charles V, kind of a classy dude, said, I do not quarrel with the dead. So, um, the quote eventually does end. I forgot the quotation mark. But, so he doesn't dig him up. But, Saxony, this area where Germany, of Germany, where Luther is strongest, has just been taken over. 
Not to mention, theologically, Lutheranism splits into two rival camps. They're known as the Philippists, which follow Luther's chief, uh, uh, chief number two, if you will, Philip Melanchthon, uh, and the Genesio Lutherans. Genesio means authentic. So they called themselves the authentic Lutherans, the true Lutherans, the ones that were really followers of Luther. Because Philip Melanchthon, in some ways, was very Calvinist. Like he had a much more Calvinist view of the Lord's Supper than Luther did. Remember, we've talked about that view of the Lord's Supper a lot, the difference between the two, the real presence of Christ's human flesh. Uh, so they were also called crypto-Calvinists. At the same time, though, the Philippists were also very anti-reformed when it came to, say, God's sovereignty and election. They had a, they had a much more uh, Erasmian view, so Erasmus of Rotterdam, a much more humanist um, kind of view, a positive view of free will than, say, the Calvinists did. It led to 30 years of theological war until finally in 1577, so 31 years after Luther died, they came up with the formula of Concord, which paved the way for what we would call Lutheran orthodoxy which was largely a triumph for the Genesio Lutherans. There were a few things thrown in to that statement of faith that was slightly towards Melanchthon's followers, but in the end, the, the authentic Lutherans won the day. And so you enter this time known as Lutheran Orthodoxy. So the period between 1580 and 1730, following the publication of the Book of Concord, so Formula, Formula of Concord comes out 1577, that's kind of this, this statement of faith, they bind it together with the Augsburg Confession and a bunch of other, Luther's larger and smaller catechism, and they make this one big book of this is what we believe called the Book of Concord in 1580. This time period is also known as Lutheran scholasticism. Going back to our lecture on Luther, was Luther a fan of the philosophy of the Middle Ages? So specifically Aristotle. No, but... No. I mean, there's no way of escaping. I mean, his whole methodology was, was rooted in it, so there's no way to escape it. But Luther really had negative, negative things to say about Aristotle, specifically the way the medieval thinkers used Aristotle to subvert what he thought was true biblical teaching. At this time now, a bunch of Lutheran scholars come in and they say, well, no, the problem's not Aristotle's methodology, it's the way you use it. So if we use it in an appropriate way, Aristotle's still a great way for doing thinking, for metaphysics, for doing theology. And so, so that's why we talk about medieval scholasticism, now they call this Lutheran scholasticism, because they're appropriating the methodology of Aristotle in their way of doing theology. Needham, so Nick Needham, our unofficial course textbook, states that this period was characterized by two things, right? Arist Aristotelian methodology, and systematic theology. You see the rise of just in numerous systematic theologies. What's a systematic theology? So if you go out to the bookstore, to the Christian bookstore, and you say, oh yeah, show me your systematic theologies, what would you find in that section? Probably nothing. What? Um. <laughs> <laughs> or nothing good. Yeah? It's a, it's a theology that it kind of like builds on itself as it keeps going, and there's a a thread to it. They're not isolated portions of like soteriology. And well, so, so let's think about this way. Say you want to go to seminary, right? Say you say, Jason, you just inspired me to study church history, and I want to go to Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary also and study history. Right, so so there's historical theology, there's biblical theology, there's systematic theology. What What is systematic theology? It's like what the whole Bible says about particular topics. Correct. So it's it's... People use it in a negative way sometimes, right? But it's systematizing. What does the Bible say about baptism? What does the Bible say about salvation? What does the Bible say about angels? What, and, and it puts these all in these different categories for you to study. You study the kind of the whole breadth of Scripture on that one particular topic. That's what systematic theology is. And the rise of it really comes in Lutheran Orthodoxy. They are publishing tons of these systematic theologies. Systematic theology is... You know, when you go to seminary, regardless of whatever degree you get, Master of Arts, NTS, whatever, you have to take systematic theology. It's one of the core courses in all, in all master's level seminary courses. Um, but it gets a bad rap sometimes because people can get so into the theology and explaining what the Bible says about it that they kind of come off as cold or intellectual, that these things don't matter, that they care more about doctrinal conflict 
than they do about piety and living a godly and God-honoring life. Which Lutheran orthodoxy, it deals with that same struggle. It's accused of that. Uh, it has several leaders. You might have, if you've read a church history book before, you might have heard of Martin Kimnitz. There's a guy named Johann Gerhard. And uh, one that they called the Lutheran Grand Inquisitor, which is this guy named Abraham uh, Kaloff. He, it's important to remember at this time, that, and it's so hard for us to understand, that Lutherans and Reformed are not friends. They are not friends. The, the Lutherans specifically, most of them view Calvinists in the same light that they view Catholics. It is a very bitter time. He wrote, his, his lectures against Calvinism were so over the top that the neighboring, the neighboring kingdom, German kingdom of Prussia, would not allow any of their students to study in Wittenberg. Um, he was that anti-Calvinist. So it's important to know that during this time that you know the enemy of your enemy is not necessarily your friend. Sometimes the enemy of your enemy is also your enemy. Uh, and Lutherans, many Lutheran theologians, really feared Calvinism, which was becoming pretty popular, especially in southwestern Germany. Uh, in Prussia, the area near Wittenberg where Berlin is, uh, most of the people were Lutheran, but the, the rulers, the Hohenzollern family, which would eventually become the Kaisers of Germany, they were actually reformed. Right? So you had reformed leaders that were kind of trying to bring reformed influence into their kingdom, but they had Lutheran people, so not a great deal. And so this Lutheran orthodoxy had produced some great theology. Uh, and people like Johann Sebastian Bach, who we were listening to right now, he owned a basically a study Bible written by Abraham Kaloff. So there's, it's, a, it's, it's not just this sterile time. However... There was a belief, which is probably not without warrant, that the only thing Lutheran theologians and pastors cared about was fighting with other people on theology. Where is, where is Christian life? Where is, where is this truth mediated through the body of Christ in the community? And it led to the rise of what we call pietism. Pietism. Pietism, Needham says, was a movement for spiritual renewal within... It's important within the German Lutheran churches. It's kind of it's kind of a 17th century version of what's going to happen in the 18th century with Methodism. Methodism starts as a spiritual renewal movement within the Anglican Church. Uh, it is not it is not founded as a separate thing. It later becomes a separate thing, but it starts as a renewal movement from within. The spiritual father of it was this handsome guy, Philip Jacob Spinner. Uh, one of your readings is from him. He wrote a famous work called Pia Desideria, which means Holy Desires in 1675, which kind of became a spiritual manifesto for the movement. And he argued for six things. And you tell me how, how rational or ridiculous you find these things. One, more serious attempts should be made to understand the Word of God through such things as small group Bible studies. What do you think? Ridiculous or good idea? Good idea. Okay. It took a little while, but... <laughs> Where is it in Scripture? Doctrine of the priesthood of all believers should... Well, if you read uh, Philip James Spinner, he'll show you. Doctrine of priesthood of all believers should receive new emphasis. Which was... The doctrine of the priesthood of all believers was something that Luther was really big on. Right? We are all, in, in a certain way, priests. Not all of us are called to preach, to administer the sacraments, but we're all called right, to share the testimony of the truth uh, not only in the church, but outside the church as well. And he did not think that was being emphasized enough. People basically came, and they heard sermons, and they went home, and that was the end of it. Uh, more attention should be given to the cultivation of individual spiritual life. What do you think? Good idea? Bad idea? Sounds like a good idea to me. Truth is not established in disputes so much as in repentance and a holy life. Spinner didn't argue that we shouldn't engage in theological debate when need be. We shouldn't sacrifice the truth. At the same time, if you think the only way to spread truth is through argument, he thinks you're doing it wrong. Right? It's kind of it's kind of what uh, if you were in the early service or you were watching what Pastor John talked about. Right? He went to his dad and he said, "Hey, how do I teach this guy humility?" And he said, "Hey, humility is rather you know caught than taught." 
Right? So what did he do? He modeled humility for the guy, and what happened? Eventually, over time, he changed. Spo spoiler alert if you're in the second service. <laughs> well, Spinner's basically saying a very similar thing. Like, hey, we need, we need to have those theological debates in the appropriate times, but at the same time, we need to be actually showing repentance and a godly life in our own walk. Uh, candidates for the ministry should be true Christians. Which crazy <laughs> sounds ridiculous to say that, but again, you have to remember we're still. I know the Reformation happened, but we're still living in a time when to be a member of the church is to be a member of the state, right? So you're born in the Lutheran Saxony, you are baptized as a child as a Lutheran, and you grow up, and you can go to university and study and get your doctorate, and you can know all of these spiritual truths, right, and not be reborn, and so thought it was important that the ministry should be full of true Christians. This is actually going to be a theme we see in the Great Awakening in America in the 18th century. And then finally, sermons should be simple and spiritually edifying. So what Lutheran Orthodoxy produced were lots of pastors who got in the pulpit that seemingly wanted to show how smart they were. They would throw a lot of Greek and Latin and foreign languages in there, and they wouldn't translate them as if anyone in the congregation could actually understand what they were talking about. Uh, they basically preached to show how learned they could be. And Spinner said, no, that's not what sermons are supposed to do. They're supposed to be edifying. They're supposed to, they're supposed to try and, through the Holy Spirit, implant that truth so that truth, again, is lived out in the body of the people. Which, again, is one of the reasons, and even if you're doing that right, how much of the Bible are you going to hear from the pulpit in your life? No one, no one is going to be able to preach to you every verse of the Bible in your life faithfully from the pulpit. If you live long enough, they live long enough, maybe a good bit of it, but not all of it. Which is one of the reasons, hey, we should have these small group studies. Because, again, this is a time when not everyone owns a Bible. He thinks every household, every uh, leader of household should have a Bible. All right. So, why waste our time with Lutheranism when we can get to the really exciting stuff, right? <laughs> so what happened in the Reformed faith after Calvin's death? So again, when we talked about Zwingli and the Reformed, we didn't really go past Luther's death in 1564. So what do you think happens in the Reformed faith after Calvin's death? Well, you said it got pretty popular. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. It, well, it did. At the end of his life, so John Calvin died in May 1564. By the time of his death, look at the advances of the Reformed faith. So the Church of England, 1559, is reestablished by Queen Elizabeth with broadly Reformed theology. 1560, Church of Scotland, which we talked about last week, is founded on firmly Presbyterian Reformed principles. 1562. So in 1555, the number of Reformed congregations in France, <coughs> Needham says, was five. In 1555, there were five Calvinist churches in France. In seven years, it's 2,150. And guess how they got those 2,150? Missionaries from Geneva. They sent out a, 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 almost 100 missionaries from Geneva. Which is always, right, so this is the importance of history. When you hear people come out and they say, Calvinism doesn't care about missions, John Calvin and the Geneva Academy would disagree, as were the 2,000 churches that were founded in seven years in France. And then 1563, we see the Heidelberg Catechism drafted, which was for uh, Reformed churches in southern Germany, of which... Uh, Calvinism had started to take uh, a much deeper root than, say, like in uh, Eastern Germany uh, or Northern Germany. Uh, it also became the official religion in the Netherlands as well. So you have basically England, Scotland, the Netherlands, a huge minority in France, uh, most of Switzerland all reformed. Meanwhile, you have Scandinavia and Denmark and Northern and Eastern Germany that are all Lutheran. So that's kind of the, the breakdown. But the Reformed faith is spreading by the time Calvin dies in 1564. I mean, it's, it's got legs. And it's really carried on by his chief assistant, a guy named Theodore Beza. Theodore Beza is a really interesting dude because before he was a reformer, he was born into the French nobility. Uh, he had actually written some very erotic love poems and published them before he was... Uh, a reformer to which the Catholics made good use of after he became a famous reformer. Uh, he was living a pretty dissolute life. But he became a reformer, he went to Geneva, he succeeded John Calvin as spiritual leader of Geneva in 1564. 
And he was influential in consolidating the Reformed faith and perpetuating it uh, out into the rest of Europe. He's one of those guys that people would write to and say, hey, Beza, I need your help, bro. Blah, 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 blah. He's one of those kind of guys, just like Calvin was. Uh, he was a key player in international affairs. He went all over the place, especially in his native France. Uh, he was a big influence on King Henry IV's mother, so much so when Henry IV was a boy, that when he was an adult, and he actually brought his army outside of Geneva because he was going somewhere, he actually, when he met Beza again for the first time in a while, called him Father. The King of France is calling this guy Father. It's a pretty, uh, pretty interesting deal. Henry IV, remember, was a Protestant that converted to Catholicism in order to become King of France. He said Paris is worth a mass. Uh, but as the now Catholic monarch of France, he issued an edict called the Edict of Nantes in 1598, which basically granted freedom of worship to the Reformed Christians in France, which would last for almost 100 years until King Louis XIV got rid of it. He published the French Psalter. Who knows what a Psalter is? It comes from a tradition that uses a Psalter. Yeah, it's like a hymnal, but the hymnal is nothing but the Psalms. So in more... In more um, Traditionally Reformed churches, so like say many Presbyterian churches, Dutch Reformed churches, they don't sing hymns. Uh, hymns are too new. They sing the Psalms, uh, the Psalter. He published a French one, 1562. They basically translated it into other uh, languages, English, Dutch. And that's important. You're like, okay, wow, he published a songbook. You have to understand the importance of song in this time period. Again, this is a time when people are illiterate, for the most part. Um, you know, literacy is, you do not have universal literacy like we have today. People learn theology, people learn doctrine through songs. So the Huguenots, who were the French Protestants, when they would go into battle against the Catholics, they would be singing basses from basses Psalter. Uh, Oliver Cromwell, Oliver Cromwell, in the, uh, when we get to next week, his armies, when they went into battle against the, uh, the king's forces, would sing the psalms. So uh, Lutheranism spread through the use of not only the psalms, but especially Lutheran hymns. So music today is kind of a preference thing that we, you know, the, oh, the music's too loud, or oh, I want rock band, or oh, I want old school. Um, for them, they wanted to sing God's, God's words back to him, the Psalms, and it had a profound influence in actually spreading the message of the gospel in an age when people could not read the Bible or could not afford a Bible. He also produced a critical edition of the Greek New Testament. A critical edition means that it's annotated with notes, um, culled from the best sources. So before this, Erasmus had done one. Remember we talked about that Luther used profitably. But Erasmus didn't have a lot of or Greek manuscripts to work with. Beza Beza got a lot of really good ones, including one that's basically a complete, a complete version of the Bible from, I think, the 4th century called the Codex Beza, which Cambridge University now owns. But he produced this version of the Greek New Testament that became part of the received text. So it's part of the text that they used in making the Geneva Bible in English, which was influential with the Puritans, and then eventually the King James Bible. So the King James Bible actually owes a lot to the Greek edition of the Bible that Beza published. Yes. How did Beza get his hands on these manuscripts? So he actually got Codex Beza, or I think it's Codex Beza, is how you say it, from the French Reformed churches. So when they were, the French were periodically getting persecuted by the Catholics in France, and they would get French refugees coming into Geneva, or coming into, you got to remember 1572, you have the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in France, where remember we talked about that, they killed like 20,000 Protestants throughout all France. The reform movement never recovered. I mean, it looked it looked at the time of Calvin's death like the reformed faith was going to become the faith of, of France. And then 1572, they slaughtered 20,000 Protestants, including most of the noble families that backed the Protestants, and the reformed faith never, never recovered. So you're getting all these refugees, and they actually had it. I don't know where they got it from, but one of those churches or one of those Protestants had it and gave it to Beza. He used it in his translation, and then he gifted it to Cambridge University, where you can still go use it today. Which is so that so the two there are there are three really kind of big they call them codexes of the the Greek New Testament. There's Beza, there's uh, uh, Sinaiticus, and there's Vaticanus, which is at the Vatican. Okay, then you have this guy, Jacobus Arminius, if you've ever heard of him. 
Um, <laughs> so, he is. He's texting. <laughs> he is texting. Um, yeah. Very regal dude. He actually had a really unfortunate life. Basically, his, his dad died when he was a kid, off when he was studying. Uh, then, you know, the Netherlands was constantly at war with the Spanish monarchy because the Netherlands had broken away from Spain. And so they came in and they slaughtered his whole family, like his siblings and his mom, and he was left an orphan. He had, he had a real bad childhood. So, but he eventually became a Dutch theologian through the help of, uh, actually a mathematician kind of backed him. Uh, and he actually went to Geneva for a little while and he studied under Beza. Right? He studied under Beza. He was ordained a pastor in the Dutch Reformed Church in 1588 and appointed a professor of theology at Leiden University in the Netherlands in 1603. That's not going to be without controversy, which we'll talk about in just a second. Uh, Arminius' big deal is he rejected the double predestination taught by Beza for a doctrine of predestination based on God's foreknowledge. Okay, this is very... He's not the first one to come up with this. We've, we've seen this countless times through church history. Really, you've got to remember, Erasmus is from the Netherlands. This is really what Erasmus taught against Luther um, 80 years before this. But Arminius said, look, God does not predestine people based on his sovereignty per se. God, God knows that that person will choose him by the giving of pervenient grace, and that is what predestination is. It's God's knowing of what people will freely choose. Which, which is very, very controversial then. It is exceedingly controversial now. He was fiercely opposed by the senior lecturer at the university, Francis Gomerus. Gomerus actually, in order to get this job in 1603, Arminius had to sit down with Gomerus and prove that he was orthodox. Uh, and... I don't want to say that Arminius lied, but he didn't necessarily tell the whole truth. And so Gomer said, well, I guess, you're, I guess I heard some rumors, but you seem orthodox enough. And so he said, all right, welcome to the faculty. And then within a year, they were in a theological war with each other. So, and Gomer thought that Arminius basically, basically you know, tricked him, which historians still debate whether he did or not. Yes? Do we have any of Arminius' exegesis of Romans 9? I'd have to go, but we have his completed... Completed works. I don't know if I checked to see if there's Romans 9. But, I mean, there are, you can buy his collected works, for sure. Yeah, so we have, it's not like back in the day where people burned everyone's, everyone's writings. Uh, although, I'm sure there are many people that wanted for Arminius' writings. Uh, Arminius died in 1609. Youngish guy, by our standards, 49. Somewhat older, uh, by standards of the day. I think he died of tuberculosis. But, most of Arminius' debate, most of the struggle that was happening was between him and this super Calvinist professor, Gomerus, right? And then he, so, I mean, and it really is going on for, as you can see, 1603, 1609, like six-ish years before Arminius dies. It's really his followers that seek to take it, take it over the, uh, the line. So 43 of his followers, of Arminius' followers, which we now call remonstrants, they signed a statement of their beliefs which we call the remonstrance. So one with a C, uh, one with a T. So remonstrance in 1610. The remonstrance basically gave five doctrines that they believed that conflicted with Reformed Calvinistic teaching on predestination and God's sovereignty in salvation. All right, so we're going to talk about the five points of Calvinism in a minute. It's, it's important to know that the five points of Calvinism, which is a name given later on in history to what we're going to talk about. The five points of Calvinism are nothing but, it's, it's not the reform saying, this is, the, this is our sole theology. It's actually just a response to the Arminians, who in 1610 produced this document known as the Remonstrance. Uh, and the debate between them, between the Calvinists and the Arminians, was so <coughs> severe that it almost plunged the Netherlands into civil war. So you had most of the political leaders backing the Arminians, because Arminius, besides his teaching on predestination, he taught, he had a much more what we would call an Erastian view of the church, which means that the church should really be controlled by the state. And in the Netherlands, they said, hey, you know, church and state go together, but the church runs the church. And so the Calvinists were on the church runs the church side, Arminians were on the, hey, the state should run the church. Which, by the way, could only benefit the Arminians, because the only people that really backed them were the political leaders. 
And so this created a huge kerfuffle, uh, where it almost plunged the whole nation into war. And so they said, hey, we need to get a handle on this. So in 1617, the States General, which is basically the governing body of the Netherlands, said, we need to do a national synod to solve this conflict. And they did. They called it the Synod of Dort. It met in the, the city of Dortrecht for seven months in 1618 to 1619. And it consisted not only of delegates from the Netherlands, but of eight foreign nations to include five English delegates and one Scottish delegate. Um, in fact, the, the secretary of the Synod was William Ames, who was a very, very famous Puritan, uh, who also taught in the Netherlands. And the Synod condemned the teachings of the Arminians, the Remonstrants, and issued what we now call the Canons of Dort. You will notice your note packet is heavy today. So the pages behind your note pages are the Canons of Dort. Uh, they are well worth the 30 minutes or hour of your time it will take to read them. It is a beautiful expression, I believe, of uh, not only the biblical case, but the glory of God's sovereignty in the salvation of man. Uh, it not only affirms things, it also specifically meets the objections of the Arminians. So you'll see a bunch of basically articles, and then you'll see rejections as well. Highly worth your time. I know it seems heavy. It's actually 18 pages. Uh, it will not take you. It'll take you an hour at max to read. Uh, it is a great exposition, though, of the Reformed faith when it comes to these matters. And that's important because it's still something we're arguing about. This church, you know, we're technically Southern Baptists. We don't really involve ourselves much in Southern Baptist life. But in the Southern Baptist Convention, there is no bigger controversy than Calvinism in the Southern Baptist Convention right now. It is, and it's been a big thing for about 10 years. So, again, being good Baptists, we have to have something to fight against. We all agree that the Bible is the inerrant word of God, so we had to find a new topic. And so now it's Calvinism. Um, and, it's, and it is a huge deal. So, especially with the rise of what they call the new Calvinism, uh, you know, with leaders like John MacArthur and John Piper and um, all the, you know, R.C. Sproul and all this. So, Calvinism st still very much in vogue. Uh, I would say if you want to have a good handle on what the core issue is, then the uh, canons of Dort will not steer you wrong. But they teach what has later been, known, been called the five points of Calvinism, which you could spend an entire semester on these, so I'm just going to tell you what they are. You can ask me questions later. <laughs> They're not, they're not presented in this way in the canons of Dort. You'll find all of them. They're not presented in this way. And they're not actually, the five heads of doctrine don't actually correspond necessarily to the five uh, that you see here. Because they actually, uh, heads three and four actually combine total depravity and, um, uh, total depravity and irresistible grace. But, so you have tulip. Tulip is, you might have heard this before, tulip is the, the way to remember what we call the doctrines of grace which is what the Synod of Dort is about. T is total depravity. So all these definitions are taken from the theological dictionary uh, that Donald McKim produced. So total depravity means the sinfulness, that sinfulness pervades all areas of life or the totality of human existence. U stands for unconditional election. God elects to save some solely on the basis of his freedom and love and not on the basis of any merit or efforts on the part of humans. L, limited atonement, Christ died only for the elect, who are the only recipients of salvation. I, irresistible grace, God's grace as it works for the salvation of an individual will accomplish its purpose and will not be thwarted. And P, perseverance of the saints, God's elect who believe in Jesus Christ are held secure by God's power. Despite temptation and sin, their salvation will not be lost. So, except for total depravities, which the Arminians would, would agree with total depravity, however... I think, they're, I think they're tricky about it. Because they say, all right, you by nature, as a fallen human, do not have the natural ability to believe in God. But God now gives, thanks to the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, God now dispenses what's called prevenient grace. That means it goes ahead of time. To all humans, which now gives you the ability to believe. Right? If that is your, if that is your choice. Which I think is kind of a, a clever way of saying we're not Pelagian. Uh, they still want to say, like, hey, human nature fell uh, through Adam and Eve in the garden. However, all humans have been restored, uh, thanks to the sacrifice of Christ, to where they can freely, if they so choose, embrace spiritual truth. So, uh, they believe in total depravity, but definitely different than, than the Calvinists. The Calvinists would say, because you're dead in your sins, 
Right? You're incapable of believing until the Holy Spirit changes your heart. And if the Holy Spirit changes your heart, then you freely choose to follow Christ. I think we talked about, maybe we talked about this before. John Piper does a great discussion of this on Lazarus in the tomb. When Jesus comes up to the tomb where Lazarus is dead and he says, Lazarus, awake. Or he actually says, Lazarus, come out. Does Lazarus have the choice to stay dead? No. No. When, when Jesus says, Lazarus, come out, Lazarus is resurrected. And what does Lazarus do? When he wakes up, he's like, oh, I'm in burial clothes, and he comes out. So Calvinism teaches that God has to change your heart. And if he changes your heart, if God says, Jason, come out, right, then you're going to wake up, and you're going to come out to see your, your friend, your Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, God saves because he chooses to save, not because you do anything good, right? Everything good that you do, first off, Ephesians says, God prepared for you to do. And the Bible also says, is are your wages, are your debt, not something that is something that goes to your account as meritorious. Which, again, we've seen this time and time again. This is not, Calvinism didn't invent this. We saw this with Augustine. We saw this with Gottschalk. We, we've seen this countless times now in this church history course. The idea that God alone saves. We even see it uh, with guys like Aquinas. Uh, and then L, limited atonement. When Christ died on the cross, he didn't die for the possibility that people would be saved, right? So when, when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die so that, may, so that any of you in this room could maybe one day believe in him. No, 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 no. Jesus died on the cross specifically for individual people, right? So when he died on the cross, he didn't die for man in the abstract. He died for Gary. He died for Scott. He died for Sarah. He died for Jason. That's what Calvinism teaches, because otherwise you're saying that Jesus, when Jesus died on the cross, it doesn't save all the people it pays for, which makes it an incomplete sacrifice, which is, to Calvinism, a terrible thing to say, that Jesus' sacrifice is in some way not complete. It, it is complete for all it was meant to save. And then P, perseverance of the saints. If you're truly saved, if you've truly, if the Holy Spirit has really awakened your heart, if you've really come out of that tomb, Right then, despite the, still the sinfulness that's going to be in you and the temptation, is that God will persevere you to the end. You will, you cannot lose your salvation once given, because it's given. It's not something you earn. You can't take it. Right? You can't give it away. It's something that God does in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. So that's what that's the Calvinist reaction to Arminianism. Basically, take all these and flip them, and that's the point of the Arminians. Right? Jesus died for everyone on the cross. The aggregate of man. So maybe they believe in him, maybe they don't. But he died for every single person. Uh, God's election is based on his foreknowledge of the decisions people will make. Uh, people can resist the Holy Spirit. They don't. God can call them and them not choose to follow. Uh, and even if they might be saved today, you can't guarantee that they'll be saved tomorrow. You can fall from grace. Those were the points the Arminians made. Where do you stand on these? Personally. Say it again? Where do you stand on Oh, I'm a raging Calvinist, so I am, <laughs> I am, I am for all five points. Um, uh, the Senate of, I, I think the canons of Dort do a great, better job of explaining it than I do. But no, I am, I am no friend, I am no friend to the Arminian points. Is there a concise way to, to parallel Calvinism and Arminianism with covenant and dispensational theology? Ooh, that's a great question. That's one of the ones we plant for John. Um, <laughs> Because no. most, most Calvinists go with the covenant, right? And most Arminians go with dispensation, but that's not true all the time. Correct. So like John MacArthur is a great point. John MacArthur would call himself a leaky dispensational, mm -hmm. uh, dispensationalist, which I kind of don't understand. I, I find it an intriguing point to be reformed in dispensational. But there are guys that do it. Um, dispensationalism comes by much later in the 1840s. Uh, most people you meet that are dispensationalists would not... Strictly be Arminians, they're, they're a, I would say, a, a, a very weird, they're mostly Arminian with maybe, maybe they kind of like this part. We had a pastor say that he was a four and a half point count. Yeah, well, what was the half point? I think that, I think the limited atonement is a sticking point for many that are, that agree with total depravity and, and unconditional election, and irresistible grace, first person state, but the limited atonement, i.e., Somehow the connotation that Christ did not die for all yes. is a sticking point. No, it is. And well, and I think again, if you grew up in America, especially in the church, I mean I didn't grow up in the church, but you know, Sarah and her family, I mean, they I mean, they all grew they all grew up in the church. Their family grew up in the church. 
you know, one of the, what's one of the most common things we've heard from, you know, the people that were holding the line against theological liberalism in the 20th century? You know, they were fundamentalists. They kind of threw a lot of theology out of the boat just to keep the boat afloat. God bless them, right? But, you know, two of the things I always heard growing up from, you know, my Christian friends, of which I was not one, was, you know, accept Jesus into your heart and, you know, Jesus died for you. So in Calvinism, so I would never go up to a sinner and say Jesus died for you. I would say Jesus died for sinners. He died to save sinners. And if you if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, right? So so I think, and because Calvinists don't say Jesus died for you, people in some way think that they're anti-missionary. They don't want to share the God. I, I think it's furthest from the truth. We're going to see in history again, the, the foundation of the modern mission movement in English is all done by Calvinists. We see in, in Geneva it's done by Calvinists. But that being said, yeah, I think you be a four. I've, I've met four-point Calvinists that are not dispensational seated that are covenant theology. I, I, what I would say is that most of the time, Reformed are covenant. Arminians can be dispensational or not. Um, so dispens dispensationalism is a mode of understanding uh, God's revelation in the Bible that I think uh, is helpful to Arminianism, but I met Arminians that don't believe that. Uh, but I would say covenant theology is much more linked to being Reformed than, say, dispensationalism is to Arminians. Nick? Um, how did Calvin get stuck with the name? Like, yeah. Obviously, he is not the he's yeah. not guy. He's not there. But how, and he's been dead almost 50, 60 years. Like, how, yeah, and, how this, is, and this is nothing different than, than Luther teaches right. in the bondage of the will. Right? So how, does, how does he get pinned with the name? Yeah, um, so an intriguing question. Because Calvin, like, remember we talked about Calvin. Calvin wasn't necessarily that even the most prominent guy during his lifetime, right? I told you in England, Heinrich Bollinger was just as influential as John Calvin was. I think Beza, I think Beza really made Calvin the guy because Beza was a pretty prolific writer. He was a very smart guy. He lived a long time after Calvin died. He lived 40, 41 years almost after Calvin died. And he really, uh, as a disciple of Calvin, perpetuated his thought. So it, it, it got called Calvinism. But if you went to an, one of the early Puritans in the 1570s and you called him a Calvinist, I don't think they would have really understood what you were talking I mean, they would have understood the connotation, but they wouldn't have said, oh, I'm a Calvinist. Um, they wouldn't have used that language. Calvin would absolutely abhor that it's called Calvinism. In fact, Calvin, we didn't talk about this, Calvin got buried in an unmarked grave because he did not want people venerating his grave. So... Um, he kind of struggled with pride in his life, and you know he confessed on his deathbed that humility was something he he had always struggled with. So, in kind of a last humble gesture, he said, "Throw me in a you know in a, in a poor graveyard in an unmarked grave." So, we actually don't know exactly where Calvin's grave is. So, I'd have to look. The, it's written down somewhere as far as when Peel actually started specifically calling this Calvinism. I think it's called, it's because Beza, between Calvin and Beza, they taught it most succinctly, and they. They put a lot about it out, but again, it was never the focus. It, Calvin had a very, how would you say, a very well-balanced theology. So predestination takes up about 20 pages in the Institutes. The Institutes in the copy I have is over 1,000 pages, or, or almost 1,000 pages. So 20 pages out of 1,000, that's not a lot. It was important to him, but it wasn't like, this is my overarching thing. Beza did a, did a, a good job of teaching predestination after that, kind of solidifying it, I think as a result of that, it got called Calvinism. But again, I think as we've studied in history, I think this is Augustinianism. In fact, you know, you know pardon to any Arminians watching the camera, but I mean, I think it's straight biblical. I, mean, I think it's what the Bible teaches, so. Uh, but we're going to see right now in the next controversy in the reform world that the problem with the L. Limited atonement is always the one that gets people. Uh, and the four-point Calvinism is also known as Amiraldianism. Say that one time fast. Amiraldianism. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> it's named after, I cannot pronounce French, but Moise Amiral. I think is how you say that. Uh, he taught that Christ died for all men on condition that they believe. So this is also known as four-point Calvinism or hypothetical universalism. So it's, it's straight up four-point count. And we're fine with the T and the U and the I and the P, but we're not comfortable with the Jesus only died for some people 
Right? He died for all men on condition that they would believe. However, God elects who is going to believe. Uh, do you think that this was a compromise that most were willing to accept? No. Oh, there's been a really good uh, history of people getting along. <laughs> Theological conflict always just works itself out, right? Never any point. Uh, yeah. So... The French church is the one that really, which really, you know, uh, accepted Amiraldianism. Several times, uh, the more reformed ministers in France tried to get Amirat and his teaching condemned. Every time it was upheld as being orthodox. It even had a few English proponents, a few Puritans, Richard Baxter being the most famous Puritan to be an Amiraldian, Amiraldian or a four-point Calvinist. Uh, but it was also opposed by many Reformed theologians. One of the big ones on the continent was a guy named Francis Turretin, who you can still buy his works. And the Mac Daddy of them all, the, the Prince of Puritans, John Owen. John Owen, his first published work was called The Display of Arminianism, which is a fantastic read. Uh, not only because of his uh, biblical knowledge, but just back then, people were fun when they wrote. They didn't for the most part, right for people's feelings. So uh, uh, it's just, even the ones that were very temperate and humble, when they got, they were like, you know, Christians on Facebook, once you put them behind a keyboard, they're brutal. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, he also wrote what's considered the best defense ever of limited atonement. It's called the display, um, what is it called? The Death of Death and the Death of Christ. Uh, you can still buy it today. J.I. Packer gives a great forward to it. It is considered... Uh, the unrivaled uh, defense of limited atonement, in which Owen specifically critiques Amiron uh, and four-point capitalism. Would it be correct to say the opposite, that people believe because of irresistible grace? Say that again? Would it be correct to say that uh, people believe in Christ as a result of irresistible yeah. grace? What that is <laughs> Trying to understand it. So he, what he's saying is that Christ died for those who believe. No, so he has no problem. He has, yeah, so, yeah. So that's why it's called hypothetical universalism. So Christ died for everyone on the condition that they would believe. And, and God elects who's going to believe. So in the end, so in the end, the only people that are elected are the ones that God sovereignly chose. However, Christ died on the cross for this specific condition by which God would meet. Whereas Calvinism would say that Jesus dying on the cross is sufficient to save every human of their sin if God had willed it. But God willed only to save a certain group, and so those are who Jesus died for. But his, his sacrifice is of infinite value, so if God had decided to save every last human through it, his blood could easily have paid for it. That's, that's the Calvinist teaching. Amirald's teaching was... Jesus died for everyone on condition that they believe. God is the one that fulfills that condition. So what you just said, does that mean God died, or Jesus died for people who believe, or he died for everyone, well, according to Amirald? Well, so uh, Amirald would say Jesus died for everyone on condition that they believe. So that is how he would phrase it. So kind of go into, like, you're saying, as opposed to God who pre predetermined or... or predestined people prior to being born. No, 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 no. He still believes that. So, so... How do I get back to my that whole? Um, well, maybe with Arminius, not necessarily with Andrew. All right. So, so Arminianism, real quick, if you don't mind my drawing. Arminianism says, basically, like, pardon the crude expressions. Let's say Jesus died. Jesus died for every human being. He paid for their sins. And now, obviously, in Arminianism, you still have to believe to be saved. Basically, what Arminius is saying is that Jesus' blood, that infinite sacrifice, goes into the bank. Goes into this giant bank. And then you, as, say, Joe Blow, decide one day, you know what, I really want to follow Jesus. And you go up to the bank and you say, hey, I would like some money. And it says, oh, here you go, Joe. Here's your money. Right? Jesus didn't die for Joe. Jesus died to put all this money in the bank. That's Arminianism. Mm -hmm. Calvinism says that in this bank, God created basically individual accounts. And so, when God changes Joe's heart to follow him, Joe 
right, goes and he receives his inheritance, right? The, the inheritance that Jesus has already paid for, right, in the bank. So Jesus didn't die just for this, this, this general fund in the bank. He died so that you could basically have your individual savings account. Again, pardon, I don't know a better way to explain it. Andy Raldianism is saying, well, so this is Joe, let's say, free will. Say this is Joe, Holy Spirit. Old Patrick. Old Patrick. <laughs> and say this is Joe, Holy Spirit. Right? At bank. So Jesus, Jesus dies to put all this money in the general fund. However, right, the only people that are going to receive the money from that general fund are those that believe. That believe by the Holy Spirit as opposed to free will. So it's Calvinist in its understanding of how you come to salvation. The difference is basically in how it is allotted. Does that make any sense? Does that picture do anybody any good? Right? That, that's kind of the difference on what's going on. Um, so that's like Jill walking past the bank saying, oh, let me pull out some money here, rather than God pointing to Joe, hey, why don't you go to this bank? Kind of thing, is that what you're saying? As far as the difference between Arminianism and yeah. Andy Raldianism? Yeah, yeah. So first off, it's Joe's like, hey, yeah, yeah, that's a cool bank. And, and God's saying, no, 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 I've got, I've got an inheritance for you, Joe. However, the inheritance isn't necessarily split up. Uh, and I've never, done, I've never actually taught Andy Raldianism in quite this way, but um, it, it's not necessarily broken up into the individual savings accounts. It's, it's for everyone on condition that they believe, but God fulfills the condition. Unlike here in Arminianism, where God presents the conditions, but you fulfill the conditions. So I, I, get, I get the conditions, um, but do either of those two teach that there's extra money in the bank at the end of time? For those who didn't believe, that could have withdrawn. You see what I'm saying? So the Calvinism yes. says that that's limited, meaning there was never anything in the bank for all of those people who did not believe. Yeah, that's as opposed to the so. So the bank accounts are those still limited, or are is there? Like Calvinism would always say that in the time the bank is empty. Like that's the yes. principle. Of, well, so the, so the principle the principle is if God had decided to save everyone, there'd be saving count for everyone. So it's, it's not saying, it's saying that the uh, efficacy, so to use the appropriate theological term, the eff so God's, so Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient for all, but it's efficacious. It is efficient for some. I right? know some are the ones that God has chosen. So the problem, one of the arguments that Calvinists would have with Arminianism is at the end of the day, Calvinism would say that's exactly what the Arminians are saying. That if Jesus died for every individual human, and, and not every individual human is saved, then Christ's sacrifice is an incomplete sacrifice because it does not save everyone it's meant to save. Or maybe incomplete or... or overcomplete. Over overcomplete. Well, yeah. over, you know. well it, it, it means that his blood, his blood paid for a sin that was not atoned for. So if Jesus died for every man, say he died, excuse me, Gary, say he died for Gary, right? But Gary doesn't believe. Then it means Jesus died for Gary and yet Gary is still in hell. That is an incomplete sacrifice. So it's a pointless sacrifice. It is a pointless. That would be one way of saying it, yes. <laughs> that's, that's the rub. That's the rub. I am I'm not a fan of Amiraldianism or of Arminianism. So, last question. Kind of get off theology a little bit. How does an open window and a pile of horse dung relate to one of the worst conflicts in European history? You didn't put that in the notes. Oh, well, I did. I did, but later on. That's all right. We'll get there. So let's rewind for a second. Let's rewind. So again, we talked about the small Catholic War right after Luther died. The Lutheran princes are broke by the Emperor Charles. Uh, in 1548, the emperor issues what's known as the Augsburg Interim, which basically says in all of the Protestant lands he's conquered, they're going to reinstitute Roman Catholicism. They'll allow a few exceptions. They'll allow priests to get married. They actually get the Pope to buy off on that just so they can have peace in Germany. But for the most part, those Protestant lands, you're going to be Catholic again. Uh, the Protestant princes turn the tables on the emperor in 1552 uh, and basically chase them out of the empire. 
And so in 1555, we get what's known as the Peace of Augsburg, which the Peace of Augsburg instituted a policy known as whose region, his religion. So basically he said, all right, we're done with the fighting. If, you're the, if you are the ruler of Saxony and you're a Lutheran, fine. You and your people can be Lutheran, but they got to be Lutheran. Right? And if I want to be Catholic, then I'm going to be Catholic and all of my people are going to be Catholic. So whatever the religion of the leader is, that's what the religion of the people can be. But it had a major flaw. It only applied to Catholics and Lutherans. It did not apply to the Reformed. Of which, like I said, in Germany there was a significant portion by this time. So, religious tensions then as a result, not only between uh, the Reformed, right, but just the Lutherans and the Catholics, led to, in 1608, the founding of basically another Protestant NATO. This was called the Protestant Union. And it was one of the few times where the Calvinists and the Lutherans said, okay, let's quit fighting each other and let's get on the same team. Uh, and they formed this Protestant Union in 1608, to which the Catholics responded with the Catholic League in 1609. It reminds me of NATO and the Warsaw Pact, just... You know, several centuries earlier. There's nothing new under the sun, as Ecclesiastes would say, in the next room. Um, it's the defenestration of Prague on May 18, 1618, that is generally considered the start of the Thirty Years' War. What is defenestration? We talked about this before. Oh, not throwing something, not falling, throwing something out of a window. When is another time in church history we saw a defenestration? Oh, a guy got thrown out of the window in Prague. Right now, right after uh, John Huss was condemned at the Council of Constance. So uh, Needham actually puts a little joke. He says, throwing people out of windows must be like the state sport of Bohemia. Because um, they just love throwing people out of windows. Basically, long story short, there was the threat that the next emperor, who would also be king of Bohemia, was a radical Catholic. And in his own lands, he had already kind of purged all the Protestants. So all of the Protestants and Hussites in Bohemia were afraid of that. And so some Protestant guys went into a castle where the, the Catholic rulers' men were meeting. They threw them out of a window. They didn't die. They landed in horse dung. They're fine. Uh, well, they're dead now. And, <laughs> and uh, basically started, and then they elected a Protestant king in, in their place. This started a 30-year war, straight up, 30-year war in Europe. Uh, Catholic armies in the beginning had great success. Uh, they re-Catholicized Bohemia. They basically got rid of 200 years of the Hussites, and they overran many traditionally Protestant areas in Germany. Uh, and over time, it just went from kind of a religious conflict to just a straight secular conflict. France comes in. France, even though they're you know raging Catholic by this point, uh, they don't like the Holy Roman Emperor and his power, and so they actually back the Protestants. It's a weird kind of deal uh, by the end of it. And at the end of it, one-third of Germany's population was dead either through uh, actual battle, disease, starvation, stuff like that. So finally, 30 years later in 1648, they agreed to the Peace of Westphalia, which officially ends the war. Uh, the Reformed faith is finally recognized throughout the empire in addition to Catholicism and Lutheranism. <clears throat> and it modifies the Peace of Augsburg in two ways. Remember, I said Peace of Augsburg, whoever's ruling, that is what the religion of his people are. So it modifies it in two ways. It says... Basically, if your region in 1624 had more than one religion, they're, they're allowed. Right? So if you say, say you had half, half Catholics and half Lutherans, regardless of what your religion is as ruler, you've got to accept um, the Catholics and the Lutherans both living there. It also said uh, that if you were a Protestant and you were, say, Reformed and your people were Lutheran, they didn't have to convert to be Calvinists. They could stay Lutheran while you were Reformed. Well, that did not apply to Catholics. If you were a Catholic ruler... You had to be Catholic, unless you were exempted here. Uh, and really, the, the, no one wins in this thing except for France. Right? Protestants don't really win. Uh, the Catholic Habsburgs don't really win. It's really France that actually wins. Because after 30 years of war, the Holy Roman Empire is just depleted. They got no money. They got no resources. And this is really when we see the dominance of France for the next century or so in Europe as the prime power. All right, so our key points. One. Reformations often grow stale and are in need of renewal. We see that in Lutheran orthodoxy. We see that with the rise of pietism. Pietism, unfortunately, went in some pretty negative ways after this. But in the beginning, pietism was just a renewal movement to bring Lutheranism back to a, a lived piety based on the Word of God. We see from the Reformed that theological conflict 
often breeds theological precision. When you read the canons of Dort, when you read those, you're, you will see lots of theological rich precision. It's kind of like we talked about with the ancient councils. No one really defines the truth until someone comes around and says, that ain't the truth. And then they have to define it, which is what we see in the early church councils. The same thing I think we see with, say, the Synod of Dort. And religion is easily co-opted by the state in wartime. Uh, that's kind of one of my, my big things in my study of history is I study a lot of church-state relations, um, which makes me ever glad to be a Baptist because Baptists have always been against the church and the state having really any formal relationship because what you so often see in, these, in all these countries, which all of them had state churches, is that in the end, theology becomes subservient to the needs of the state, which is terrible for the church. And as we see, there are plenty of European countries today that have state churches that are absolutely completely dead. Um, the Church of England has less members on, on a weekend than the Islamic mosques do in England. Uh, and it's the official state church. When they, when they baptize a ship, I actually went to Portsmouth, England, the day, after they, the day they baptized, they uh, christened a ship, and they christen it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, which would be awesome if you know, we did that in America. But they, when they christen a new destroyer, they commission it in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But half of their clergy don't even believe that. So it's just stressful. All right, questions, comments, concerns, complaints. That's a lot of theological controversy, a lot of stuff going on. At the Synod of Dort, were there... Was there widespread agreement um, in, in what they were in what they were affirming as far as the atonement was concerned? Because you see, uh, Amerindialism come along not long after. So were there people who objected to what was put out at this? No, time? that's a great question. In fact, every every one of the delegates signed, including the foreign delegates. They did not have any any exceptions or exemptions. They all signed. It. We're talking about these councils now, like. Are, they, are the Catholics just completely out of the picture as far as those things go? Yeah, that's a great question. I haven't, I really haven't had time. I think in the 19th century I'm going to do a rewind and talk about it. It's important to know that in the 16th century, the Catholic Church kind of gets with a program and they say, hey, we do need to kind of tighten some stuff up. And they call it what's called the Council of Trent, which Council of Trent defines Catholicism for 300 years after this. We call that the Counter-Reformation uh, a, or a resurgent Catholicism. Catholicism kind of wakes up and says, all right, uh, we need to get, we need to kind of fix our own house, but we also need to come back to Protestants. Um, unfortunately, I just don't have the time to teach all of that history. I will touch on it briefly, probably in the 19th century when we talk about it. But yeah, Catholicism has some stuff going on too, um, specifically the Council of Trent, which is the last church council they have until, the 18, until 1870 with Vatican I. Uh, yes? Did the pilgrims come before or after this? The pilgrims came in 1620. Okay. So they, and they come from, they originally are from Scrooby, England. And they go to the Netherlands first, uh, and then they kind of don't like that all their kids are speaking Dutch and a bunch of other things. And so that they actually leave for America from the Netherlands and not from England. Are you, they were a separatist congregation from Scrooby, though. Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about the Puritans and separatists and Baptists and Congregationalists next week. All right. Anything else? Okay, I, thank you uh, for your service there in the back for all of your questions and coming week after week. So if y'all don't know, this is uh, their last week with us this week. So they are PCSing on Friday with Cocos. On Friday to, where are you going? Little Creek. To Little Creek, right? So many thousands of miles away, right? But uh, I'd just like to say thank you for coming to the class. Thank you for all your comments. And please, before you leave, just uh, thank them for being a part of our church family. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to learn more of your truth, more of what your people have done, both the positive and the negative, Lord. And we pray especially for our congregation, for our piety, Lord God, that these truths will not be sterile to us, that they would dig down deep into our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would live out the godliness that we teach. And I pray that you would be with the Coca family as they transfer to the East Coast, Lord God. That is a very stressful thing to do, especially with small children. I pray that you would be with them in that move, keep them safe, uh, that they would find a church family to fellowship with there, that they would continue to serve there, and that their children, at your appointed time and place, would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ in saving faith and serve him all their days. And it's in his name we pray to you, our Father, by the power of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.